Join the coven. I Hunt Reverse Vampires 2 A story written by Cecily 1987 Part 6 So there I was, holding Lady Blue Draven's hand as she concentrated on zapping us out of the Faraday chamber. Oh yeah, I had to address her as Lady Blue Draven, or she would snap at me and squeeze my hand with her death grip. But I'm gonna call her Alistra here in Silent Rebellion. Lady Blue Draven, Madame Monroe. I felt like I'd fallen into some sort of fantasy novel lately. But at least things seemed more high fantasy and less horror. But now things were about to go full surreal. Like a bad acid trip. It took a moment for Alistra to do whatever it was she was trying to do. We stood hand in hand in the darkness, my teammates and Monroe's disciples milling about around us as a blurry fog of motion blur. Alistra squinted her eyes and growled to herself. Damned room, this is taking longer than I thought, she spat. We stood for hours, minutes, seconds, I really don't know. It felt like waking up out of a deep sleep, fully alert and having no idea what time it was. But the world around us had changed. We had been transported somewhere entirely different. We were alone and in the open. Cold air and humid gusts of wind took turns pelting me and whipping Alistra's long hair around us. Oh god, what is that? I said. Or did I think it? I don't really know, but Lady Blue Draven heard it none the same. I have no idea, little lamb, she said with the faintest hint of awe in her voice. Remember, this world tells lies and tells truths at the same time. We have to be keen enough to tell the difference. What she said made no sense. Just like the ominous view of the dark building looming in front of us, gone were the cramped black walls of the Faraday chamber, replaced by a barren landscape of black dirt, almost like the black dirt around the volcanoes I had heard about in Hawaii. A dilapidated concrete building was the only thing to break up from the flat landscape to shoot forever upwards to dominate the skyline. As I craned my head to look up, I could see that the impossibly tall building began to twist and spiral like some sort of crazy roller coaster the further up it went. The building rose out of sight into glowing purple clouds. Well, I muttered to Alistra, whatever this building is, it must be important. We should. I looked back down when only seconds ago the building was a football field away. Now it was only a few feet away. My head swam with sudden nausea as I readjusted to my surroundings. Willpower and intent is everything here, Alistra said sternly to me. We both wanted to be closer to the building, so the world moved us. Alistra stopped to correct herself. No. We move the world to suit us. Do you understand? Yeah, I kinda do, I said, mind blown. We were so close to the building that I can make out the faded signs, annotating that we were by the emergency room entrance of a hospital. There was an awning big enough for multiple ambulances, ramps for wheelchairs, the automatic double doors in front of us glitch between fully open and fully closed, like a broken video game. St. Emily's said a sign by the door. As I stared at the sign, creepy purple stickman drawings, looking something like a kid would do, kept appearing and disappearing in different positions all over the sign and surrounding wall. Well, that's creepy, I said dryly to the nightmare fueled stick figures that blinked in and out of my sight in front of me. They waved and danced and grouped together, 
But I swear, the longer I looked, some of the positions they appeared in were far from kid-friendly. Two teams, both stairways, double time to the top floor, came a booming voice from behind us. Stop the ceremony at all costs. This scared me so bad that I instinctively spun around to face the threat. Only Lady Elistra's grip kept me from breaking free of her. Two black vans and a blacked out SUV appeared behind us. I also spotted the very recognizable pickup truck that belonged to Ma, sticking out like a sore thumb behind them. Men decked out in tactical armor jumped out of both vans. They looked like a mixture of Amit clan soldiers and Mistress Monroe's personal bodyguards. Tall statuesque women exited the SUV. All had tight-fitting Kevlar vests strapped over the outside of their voluminous robes. As they created a protective circle around the SUV, they unveiled weapons of their own. Where the soldiers and bodyguards looked like some sort of SWAT team with shotguns and ARs, the robed women held silenced weapons, long-range scoped rifles, and compact Uzis. The men charged towards us. Before they even reached the entrance double doors, the damn doors exploded inward like they had me hit with an invisible wrecking ball. The soldiers made entry, running past us without a glance, and split up into two groups, one going left, one going right. Gunfire and screams erupted from the inside as soon as the last man was in. What are they fighting? I asked curiously as I stepped towards the shattered doorway. No! Alistra snapped as she jerked me back from the threshold like I was a dog on a leash. A thick black fog filled the entranceway of the busted doorway in an instant. The gunfire and screams of the men inside were muffled by the black fog blocking us out. But I could still hear the deep thumps of explosions going off within the separated ground floor. The spell cuts the area off outside magical interference, Alistra said to me. It seems your Ame clan has walked itself into another trap. Where is this? I asked. Why are we being shown all of these things? I don't know yet, Alistra responded to me, but I know it's the future. Look! She pointed with her free hand to the SUV and truck. Madame Monroe had exited at last from the SUV. Now it made sense why the robed disciples had stayed back from the initial assault force. Vaus, Mika, and Ma approached Monroe's entourage from Ma's truck. Maybe they left me and Celia in the Faraday cage thingy, I said. This could be happening right now. Maybe, Lady Blue Draven said. It's hard to tell, but now I know why I'm here. She pointed at Voss's chest. Monroe and her people seemed to be talking with Ma and my teammates, but I couldn't hear a thing they said. Like they were on mute. Suddenly, a brilliant bolt of purple lightning hit the group of them as they huddled together around the SUV. I blinked the bright flare spots out of my eyes and tried to regain focus. Now I could hear them. I could hear the wailing and screaming coming from the group of disciples. My vision finally cleared, and to my relief, my friends were fine, all looking up towards the building in fright. But horror quickly dashed what little relief I had when I saw what had happened to the woman disciples. Their faces had melted off. At least four of them stood bare-boned, the ivory of their round skulls in stark contrast with the brown melted skin drooping and hanging around their chin and necks. The women screamed, fleshy eyes and tongues still within their exposed cranium. They fell to their knees and wailed. Only four other women remained standing. Madame Monroe, 
her daughter, and two other fair-skinned twins. The twins leaned against each other for support, chunks of skin missing or melting on both sides of their young faces. Monroe's daughter hunched over, open palms, inches away from her face as she breathed in deeply and methodically. Her face slowly bubbled and transformed like a pot about to boil. Madame Monroe was the only one out of the magic users that stood tall, angrily looking up at the purple light in the sky. If she was in pain, it was impossible to tell. Only the slight furrow of her brow and sweat glistening on her dark skin to show she was burdened at all. Madame Monroe raised her hands into the air above her, her robe wiping around her like she was in the eye of a tornado. That's when gravity shifted around me and Alistra, and we were pulled towards the giant building. Alistra hugged me close and pushed off the ground with her feet, landing us thirty feet above the side of the building. Now the floor under our feet was the vertical wall of the strange building, and inside of the building piercing up into the purple clouds. It stretched across the empty void like a bridge to the purple light at the far end. Before I could worry about my friends falling from the sudden gravity change, they were right beside me. Vaus, Ma, and Mika charging at full speed up the winding building. They jumped over open windows or ran around them as they sprinted up the side of the building towards the top. We have to keep up with my son, Alistra said as she pulled on my hand to chase after the three hunters. They were running up the side of the building with unnatural speed, and Alistra was about to dislocate my shoulder as she pulled me along. But Alistra's will to be by her son must have been incredibly strong because the distance between us and the three hunters shrunk to where we were almost right behind them. But still, the three charged upwards, never looking back. I figured this had to be showing us the future or something. Maybe the immediate future. That's why me and Celia weren't there. Hopefully we are recovering somewhere and not dead. But I doubted that my teammates were literally running up the side of a never-ending building. This was some Alice in Wonderland surrealism. Though I have seen some crazy things within this last year. This actually could happen. But I figured it was some sort of symbolism. My theory that this was all spiritual metaphor was answered when I saw enemies jump up out of the windows to face off with the Amit Hunters. Giant silver wolves sprung out of the windows to bear fangs and square off, like they were ninja turtles jumping out of manholes at the beginning of the cartoon. The giant silver dire wolves were obviously the Lobo clan. They were as tall as a man and twice as long, metallic silver reflecting the awful purple light around us. The silver masked Mavrips were defending the building, so this place was related to the cemetery battle. Three of the silver mutts charged the Amit hunters. Vaus and Ma took kneeling positions and let loose a stream of gunfire into the charging wolves. Mika took her time placing a well-placed one shot into the third. The spent shells rained down behind them to sting and pelt me and Alistra as we tried to keep up. Two of the wolves recoiled from the shots and jumped into open windows below them, taking cover from the automatic gunfire. The third, hit by Miko, went limp and lost its Spider-Man grip on the side of the building. Its massive body fell down towards us. Mika and Ma stepped out of its way as it plummeted past them, and me and Alistra just barely ducked as it sailed over our heads to plummet to the earth. I heard the shattering of glass and turned to see sparkling shards falling away from me. The two wolves that had fled from the gunfire emerged like groundhogs from a window below us. 
putting them behind both of us and the hunters. The hunters turned to face them, and now me and Alistra were caught between them. Enough, Alistra commanded, her grip tightening and the building's wall beneath our feet rippled outwards around us like we were a stone that had been thrown into a still pond. I need to see what happens at the top of this building. I need to see if Purple Eyes is freed. In a blink, the scenery around us changed and we stood upon the roof of the skyscraper. We were both bathed in a blinding purple light. I turned about to get a better view of my surroundings and almost slipped and fell from something slippery beneath my feet. Alistra groaned and pulled me back up like I was an unsteady toddler. We both looked down to realize we stood in a giant pool of blood. Human skulls and bones littered the rooftop ground around us. I could somehow feel the fear in Alistra's spike as she looked at the carnage around us. Where is Voz? she asked. She spun around hand in hand looking for him on the rooftop. There! I pointed at the silhouette of a figure a couple yards away from us. The purple glow was blinding, only leaving a dark outline of something approaching us. Wait! Can it see us? I asked, growing nervous, as the thing approached us, closer and closer. We are not really here, right? We are, and we aren't, remember? Alistra said, crouching into a defensive posture and pulling me to be protected behind her. The thing was only feet away when I can make out who it was. It was Ma. She staggered up and stopped, eyes locked with Alistra. The boy's noble's heart. Ma hissed at Alistra. It comes to me. Purple flames ignited in Ma's eyes, engulfing her head as she lunged forward, hands slamming into Alistra's chest and breaking through into a rib cage. Alistra screamed in shock, and I tried to pull her away in panic. Angel souls, demon souls, human souls, and now a noble's heart. How delicious. The twisted version of Ma sneered as blood erupted from Alistra's mouth. So much power they bring me, so much beautiful pain for me to give to punish these foul creatures. Creatures made in the image of God? I will massacre his creations before his eyes. Ma slash purple eyes began to pull Alistra's glowing crimson heart out of her chest. Alistra grabbed Ma's arm and weakly tried to stop her. I just freaked out and watched. No, 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 we can't be here. We gotta leave. I screamed at Alistra, finally using my head again. But Alistra was still preoccupied with keeping her heart in her chest to listen to me. I shook her hand vigorously, trying to get her attention. Will and intent, remember? Lady Blue Draven, Alistra, I screamed, putting my face inches from her as Ma laughed. Alistra's panicked gaze finally locked with mine. The desperation in her eyes turned to realization. Will and intent, she muttered with bloody lips. We need to go. We need to run, she spoke to me. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Suddenly we were gone, off the rooftop away from Ma and Purple Eyes, and safe. But only for the moment, because if this was the future, it meant Purple Eyes could escape. I had to wake up upset. I had to get back to the real world. We had to stop this future from happening. <laughs>